else knows what this is? A puffin. A puffin. That's exactly it. It's called a tufted puffin because it has these tufts. And I remember that when I was six years old because my dad had the same sort of hairstyle. <laughs> and so I've been working for the last eight years on this island to be able to protect this island, to protect the habitat, the plants and animals that live on this island. But in particular, one of the things that I've been focusing on is, does anybody know what this is? A fox. Do you know what kind of fox it is? Who knows what kind of fox it is? Santa Cruz Island Fox. Yes! So this fox is found on Santa Cruz Island and nowhere else in the world. So it's a, it's a special kind of fox. Just, just focusing on one species is, isn't going to get you there. Um, and in this case, we had a situation with the Santa Cruz Island Fox, a unique species that found on Santa Cruz Island and nowhere else in the world, and it was in danger of going extinct. It was in danger of going extinct because it was being heavily predated by golden eagles. And golden eagles are not native to these Channel Islands, let alone Santa Cruz Island. The golden eagles would pick up all of these foxes. These foxes had evolved for thousands of years on Santa Cruz Island and the northern Channel Islands. And they were literally the top predator, the top dog on the island. And so when the golden eagles came along, they never saw them coming. They had never evolved the instinct to look up. And the eagle population took the island fox population down from several thousand down to fewer than a hundred in less than a decade. So we thought, we have to do something to save these foxes. So we did a variety of things to save foxes. But by just focusing on the foxes and the golden eagles is a very narrow way of looking at it. We had to take what we call a multifaceted approach of being able to protect the system. Because we also had habitats there that were in the the, the the golden eagles are also feeding on feral pigs, and the feral pigs that were on the island provided a year-round and abundant food supply for the golden eagles to persist. The golden eagles showed up when bald eagles died out from the island, and the bald eagles died out from the island when large chemical companies dumped uh, DDT and pesticides, uh, DDT and PCBs into the marine environment, which killed, which poisoned a lot of the marine environment and a lot of the food supply. So you have a situation where you have a bald eagle, and these are marine predators. They don't eat, they feed primarily on fish and scavenge off of marine mammal carcasses. They don't eat foxes, typically. You have the bald eagle, and you have the foxes, and you have the golden eagles, and then you have the feral pigs. So you have this sort of complex picture of these different animals interacting in this environment. <coughs> and there you have your island fox. <laughs> I learned about the babies and their moms and how they learned how to eat and find food for themselves. I would learn how monkeys would, would make friends and build strong alliances. Um, so here's one monkey grooming the other monkey. They spend a lot of time grooming each other, and that's how they develop close friendships over time. And then I also learned about how monkeys play with each other. So this is a little baby monkey we call the baby, and this was her sister. And so I would spend hours and hours every day for several years watching these monkeys and learning about these monkeys. How do you know if a monkey is a girl or a boy? Um, well, you can tell by the little bits, different types of bits that they have. <laughs> I also learned that monkeys like to look in mirrors too, just like us. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody know what kind of sea turtle this is? Uh, what kind of sea turtle? A leatherback, that's right. It's called a leatherback because it doesn't have a hard shell. Does any, so this turtle is the largest sea turtle in the world. And slowly over time, because the government wasn't particularly engaged in the protection of these species um, until they saw that it had a huge, there was a huge potential for ecotourism and bringing people to the area. But it really wasn't until, um, it, it took about 10 years before we were able to affect policy and legislation that truly protected these species. But it wasn't, it wasn't through any sort of government enforcement that did that. It wasn't through the actual policy saying that, that thou shalt not eat turtles or kill turtles. 
it was it was the rallying together of, of the people who live there and really more so the, the school children that went to the schools and, and spent time on these beaches and snorkeled on these reefs that were the ones who really made this happen. And so my point here is, is that you don't, you don't need to be um, a big celebrity, although celebrity can sometimes help. Uh, you don't need to have a lot of money or make a lot of money. You don't need to be uh, at the top of your class. You don't need to be the smartest person. But what you really do need is you need to be dedicated and you need to work with other dedicated people to be able to pull together, to be able to, if you, if you share a vision and if you share a commitment towards protecting something or doing some good in the world, it's really quite incredible the kind of change and positive good that you can affect over time. So we would have turtle races. <laughs> so we would get a bunch of people together and then we'd release turtles and use that as an opportunity to talk about sea turtles and how you can help them. Because it has a it has a beak, a snout like a hawk, a beak like a hawk. And these sea turtles swim hundreds of miles, so they will nest in a certain area and they'll return to the same place. So this turtle comes to Barbados every year or every other year and lays her egg at the same beach every time. But then she swims off hundreds of miles to forage for a while until she's ready to come back and lay her eggs. So these satellite transmitters would tell us where these turtles were going. And leatherback turtles, they actually swim the farthest. So leatherback turtles that we'd have nesting in Barbados would swim from Barbados all the way across to Africa. And they would stay there for a few years before they'd come back to the exact same beach to lay their eggs again. One last question. How would they find the exact same beach? Ah, now that's a good question. Nobody really knows. There's a lot of different theories as to how they might find the exact same beach. Some people <coughs> think that maybe it's related to the, the magnetic force, and they have, um, they have something in their heads that's called magnetite that helps them navigate through the ocean back to the same beach. Some have thought maybe it's smell, but that's probably unlikely. Um, some think that maybe it's stars, but sea turtles don't see very well at, at long distances. So there's a lot of different, different possibilities out there, and, and that just emphasizes that there's not a lot that we actually know about these turtles, even though we've been studying them for a long time. To leave you with, too, is do some good in the world, whatever it is, helping a little old lady across the street, getting involved with some of the Amnesty International opportunities that you have there. There's tremendous opportunities that this school